I was asked by Ben Arnold, who's a coach mechanic, about uh, fluorescent fittings in his coaches and uh, how they're, they work on the 12 and 24 volts and how the tubes are driven. So it's an interesting subject. And to start off, we'll have to take a look at a fluorescent tube and understand how it works before we understand the correct way to drive it. So this is a T5 8-watt tube, and the T5 is the diameter in eighths of an inch. The 8-watt is its power rating of the tube itself, not the driver and the ballast, it's just the tube's power rating. Uh, and the 345OK, and this one is the colour temperature, which is a fairly warm white. Now you'll notice that this fluorescent tube, as most do, have two pins at the end. You do get a type of tube called an instant start, which is a single pin. It's actually a cold cathode tube. Uh, these are hot cathode tubes, and to explain that, I have to draw it. So here's the tube. And it's got a, it's, there's the pins in the end, and inside is a little filament with a coating on it. It is a filament, it does uh, heat up when currents pass through it, but it's got what's called an emissive coating on it that uh, uses the principle of thermionic emission, whereby the voltage drop across it will drop as it gets hotter, because it starts emitting electrons itself when it's hot. Now, in the tube itself, you've got... Uh, a carrier gas, which is usually argon or krypton. And mercury vapour. Mercury vapour is quite important here, and it's one of these situations that uh, mercury is still a very useful thing to actually have. Even though everybody's going, oh, it's toxic, it kills everybody, oh, if a tube breaks, run out the house, start screaming and call all the people in the hazmat suits. Don't. It's a lot of crap. There's an absolutely minute amount of mercury vapour in these. If it bursts, it'll just be gone. You know, it's just, there's not much mercury in them at all. Not like some of the older neon tubes that had a significant blob. These ones just have a tiny quantity. So, um, it's got the argon krypton as a carrier gas, mercury vapour, and when you pass current through it, the argon and krypton initially um, passes the current and it heats the mercury vapour, so that's why the tubes start dull and they get brighter. As the mercury vapour then goes from where it's settled on the surface of the tube, it gets sort of born into the gas, so to speak, and then it, it emits ultraviolet light. The ultraviolet then, light then uh, stimulates the phosphors on the inside the tube and makes them light up whatever colour the tube is. You, you do get colours of tubes. You get red, green, blue, yellow tubes. But most of them are, of course, just white or ultraviolet. So, look at these electrodes again. They have to be hot to uh, operate. If they're not hot, they'll actually be damaged. So, a typical circuit, uh, the typical main circuit would be live coming in. We'll look at the mains one, then we'll look at the low voltage one afterwards. It goes through a choke. And the reason it goes through a choke is you have to limit the current through the tubes. Once the tubes are struck, they're, the voltage across them drops significantly and they just want to draw as much current as possible. It's like sticking an LED across a battery. It would just die. You know, it would destroy the LED and in the, this case it would uh, potentially damage the tube. So, uh, from live through the choke to one end of the tube, and then from the other end of the tube to neutral, but then the other end of the filaments, the um, electrodes, goes via a starter. And the point of the starter is to initially heat these electrodes to help get the, the voltage down, get them emitting, uh, you know, emitting um, electrons into the tube and to assist it in striking. It's also worth noting, this particularly applies to the buses and the uh, things like that and vehicles, it's really helpful to have a grounded metal surface along the edge of the tube, that also helps them strike easily. If you ever have a situation that you've got a fitting that's quite stylish, architectural, and the tube's suspended away on its own, and it's not lighting, or uh, you maybe even have an earth fitting that the tube doesn't light until you touch it, that may indicate that there's not a proper grounded surface near it. Uh, if it's a metal fit fitting, uh, maybe it should be earthed, but it uh, isn't. Uh, so it's got a starter across it, and the oldest ones tended to be uh, something really simple. It was a, basically a glass lamp with two electrodes in it, neon gas inside, and then welded onto one of the electrodes was a curved bimetallic strip. And when you apply power initially, the voltage across the tube, because the tube's not struck, the voltage is quite high, and the neon starts glowing. 
And because it's glowing and heating up, the biometallic strip then extends over until it actually shorts out the neon uh, tube. And when it shorts out, the starter effectively shorts out, current then starts going through the choke, through each of the heated electrodes, the filaments, and back to neutral, and it will make them glow at the end. Then because this has shorted itself out, uh, it starts cooling down. But there's a bit of thermal inertia, but it starts cooling down and it breaks the circuit. When it does, it uh, basically, because it's breaking the inductive circuit, it turns the filaments off, it, it breaks the inductive circuit, you get a spike across the tube, and the tube may light or may not in the first, or whatever attempt it is. If it lights, then the voltage across the tube drops down to a much lower level, and it's not enough to make this, the neon in the starter glow. However, if it doesn't strike, uh, the voltage then goes back up to what it was before the full mains voltage, the neon starts glowing again, it repeats the process. And that's those old fittings that go tink, 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 and then they light. That's what's happening. It's giving, it's giving little boosts of heat to the end. Something can happen with these. Uh, if you've ever seen the fluorescent fitting that starts like that, and it, then it just sits up there. It's tried starting for a long time because the tube's dead, and then it just sits up there with the ends glowing. What's actually happened there is that the uh, biometallic strip is just welded onto the other electrode, and... This could even happen with just old starters, or even fairly new tubes. And when that happens, uh, it doesn't open, so this, the current is going through the choke, through the heating elements, the uh, heating elements, the electrodes. Um, and it just sits there with the ends glowing white hot. And that's really damaging the electrodes in the tube, and it's damaging the holder for the tube. And it's also running, potentially running the choke at much higher current than it would be normally. You know, it's putting quite a low load on it. Uh, a high load on it, should I say. So it's not a good situation. You're better, actually, if, if you get a fluorescent fitting with the ends glowing like that, it's better just removing the starter. A quick fix is occasionally to take the starter out and just chap it on a hard surface, and that makes the biometallic strip ping apart again. Not, you know, it's a quick fix. It gets the light lit, so to speak, but it's not a great thing. Uh, it's, you know, you have to make a decision, get a new starter for a start, and uh, then maybe a new tube if it's a fairly old one. So that's uh, the situation there. Now, these electrodes do have to be hot to lower the cathode fall. The cathode fall is the voltage uh, between the gas and basically the electrodes. If it's too high, if those electrodes are cold uh, and the tube is struck, and this is where some fluorescent fittings that really smash the tube up, they really blast the tube to get it to light. This is where... Uh, if it's the cold, if it's not emitting, it causes what's called sputtering. Now, sputtering is because the because of the higher voltage, there's a lot more energy when the electrons hit the surface of the the film the filament, the electrode, and that can actually blow metal off. And you end up with little particles of metal being spattered off all around it, and you end up with slight darkening. I mean, you always get it in fluorescent tubes, but. Uh, as the tube gets older or if it's abused you'll notice it getting a lot darker on the outside and that darkening is basically the metal from the filament coating the tube and as it does so it's almost an avalanche effect because there's less emissive material in the electrode the voltage will rise across it and it's a sort of avalanche effect to the point it will actually uh, result in the voltage going up to the point that you can get a couple of weird effects firstly you can get the tube may just not strike at all. That's probably a good result because the voltage across it, uh, the electrodes, is so high that the starter keeps, you know, the starter can't light it. Or should, uh, when it does try and light it, the voltage across the tube is still high enough to cause the glow starter to operate. Uh, the other thing you can get is a strange rectifying effect. You see, they call these cathodes, and the reason for that is that their main function is during the uh, each, when you feed this tube with AC, each uh, electrode takes its turn in each half wave. It's doing the bulk of the duty in the half wave. And if you ran this tube in DC, one end would get hot and the other end would stay cold. It's the, the way it works. If you get a tube that one of the electrodes is okay, but the other one's not okay, it's really sputtered, you can end up with a sort of, it almost acts like a rectifier. And when that happens, you notice the tube will be about half intense, it'll be really shimmering visibly, you'll really see mains flicker on it. And you'll probably also hear a loud buzzing noise from the choke, because the choke does not, being, does not like being 
basically run in series with a diode almost. And uh, that's that's a, another situation, get that tube out, you know, turn the light off, get that tube out as soon as possible just to protect the fitting. So now, going on to, um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying not to miss things out here. Let's go on to electronic drivers. So, um, let's get that out of the way. The cheapest and nastiest, the earliest electronic drivers had a transformer, which had a primary winding being switched by a transistor, and I'll just keep this circuitry as simple as possible, and that went 12, 24 volt, whatever it was. Uh, and there was also a feedback winding, suitable resistor, feedback winding, a bit like a dual thief, that would uh, create a sort of, that's the chassis, it would create a sort of simple oscillator. And the output of that was just a really high voltage winding. And that was connected to either one or both ends of the, both electro terminals in the tube. And it basically just treated the tube like a, neon tube, a cold cathode tube. And that's not good because uh, when you start the tube uh, cold like that, you're getting a lot of sputtering occurs. You'd notice in those, those fittings that the end went black. And it relies then that it just says, you know, it's collateral damage. It just says, you know, it's going to shorten life the tube. Once the tube, if it's driving at full current, once the tube comes up to full temperature, the electrodes themselves will, because of the uh, energy and the voltage drop across them, it will they will be self-heating. However, if they attempted to underrun the tubes, then the electrodes would never reach their temperature. Uh, and this was a common thing with those horrible little uh, fluorescent torches you used to get, little flashlights with a fluorescent tube in them that the ends used to go black really quickly. And also uh, cheap emergency lights where they just use this single transistor circuit and... They tried to skimp, you know, save battery size by underrunning the tube. So literally, you know, you get one of these fittings, you'd put it up, test it, and the ends would be black already. You know, it'd just really be bad. And likewise, as the, the ends would get even blacker, as the battery ran flat, if it didn't cut off decisively, it would the current through the tube would go lower and lower and lower, and the more uh, sputching would occur around the filaments. That that was a terrible way to drive these tubes. So. Uh, the single transistor method was not good. It also had an issue with what's called mercury migration. Now, if you drive a tube with a non-symmetrical waveform, and although this transformer is coupling the same amount of energy in each direction, effectively it can't do any otherwise because it's magnetically coupled. And if it was a nice, perfectly symmetrical waveform, square or sinusoidal or whatever shape it was, it wouldn't be that much of an issue because the current flow in each direction would be the same. However, if uh, you have a non-symmetrical waveform where it's suddenly peaking up and then it's going down slowly and peaking up and going down slowly, then you get a non-symmetrical effect whereby if I use this coin to demonstrate, if, if I put this coin in the middle of this uh, paper and then I simulate the non-symmetrical waveform by chapping it over in that direction, then coming back slowly and chapping it in that direction and going back slowly. Basically speaking, the paper is staying where it is, but the coin is gradually sliding up to one end until it goes off. And when that happens, the mercury, uh, that affects the mercury vapor. The mercury vapor will tend to migrate to one end, you know, and when that happens, you end up that the tube goes dark at one end and you end up with a purpley glow because all you're actually seeing is the carrier gas and the ultimate, the, what you could do in a situation like that, theoretically, you could turn the tube around and it would just gradually reverse and the, the light would spread out again. But this is, this is a fairly common problem with uh, electronic power supplies that don't quite have that symmetrical waveform. So the best way to drive the fluorescent tubes is with a symmetrical driver. So you might have a transformer with, say, 12, 24 volt center tap two transistors, sort of operating what you might call a, not, not quite, it is kind of push-pull, and that's going down to zero volts. And the drive circuitry, I'll keep it simple, I'll just show a little box here for the drive circuitry. And that means that uh, the transistors are alternately energised, uh, and that creates a symmetrical waveform. 
And then the ideal way to drive the tubes would be not just to have the high voltage secondary winding to actually drive the tube itself, but also to have a lower voltage high current um, secondary winding at each end. And then when you drive the tube, the cathode, the heater in the end, is actually powered by these small low voltage windings. So it's always kept just a little bit warmer. Uh, this is particularly important where you're underrun the tube, where you're running at a low level. So that keeps the filament warm and in an emissive state, but then the high voltage between here uh, then is seen across the tube from electrode to electrode and it's what actually makes the, the gas light. So uh, the tube light up. So it's, it's very complex. You know, there's a lot of science involved in fluorescent tubes. It's an old technology, but um, it's still a very, very valid technology. Um, I'd say in trucks and things like that, you're going to be trucks, buses, coaches, you're going to be switching to LED because they're a prime candidate for decent LED fixtures. And uh, I'm guessing that they probably do retrofit kits, low voltage tubes that just basically have a bit of the, in fact, you wouldn't even need a tube. You could virtually put the uh, standard LED tape inside uh, either one section for 12 volts or if you had a 24 volt supply, you could get two 12 volt sections and actually just hook them in uh, series to make up the, the 24 volts. Another thing that's worth mentioning, in, in, uh, if you look inside a neon tube, which is a cold cathode light, you'll see two wires come in, but it's actually just for support through the pinch, and then you'll see it's a tubular electrode, possibly with a little insulator to keep it away from the glass to, for thermal isolation as well. And uh, the purpose, the reason it's tubular is because the emissive surface in, is in the inside generally, and when sputtering does occur, because these things aren't really, they're really just designed to be run cold, but they will get hot because there's quite a voltage draw across them. When the sputtering occurs, because it's tubular, it tends to, some will come out the end, but a lot of it will just actually go onto the opposite surface, so it will just gradually just sputter backwards and forwards inside, and it lengthens the electrode life. So um, it's not a simple subject, but it's a very interesting subject, and to be honest, I've only just touched the surface of it. There's so much other other science. There's amalgams for storing the mercury. There's uh, the different types of uh, carrier gases and each its particular function. Uh, there's, the, of course, the ultraviolet tubes, the germicidal tubes that use the different glass. There's still loads of... Uh, the fluorescent tubes are a complex subject, and even making them is a major science. You know, the, the, the size of the phosphor particles, the uh, amount of mercury, the perfect balance before ecological safeness and, you know, enough that it's not going to result in the tube going purple over time because the mercury has been absorbed and cleaning the tube using by heating it up and drawing vacuum. There's, there's a whole science to this, but uh, that's the gist of how the drivers work for, um, for vehicles, which was the original question, which I kind of steered about a wee bit. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting subject. If you want more information, just look it up on the internet. There's no shortage of information on hot cathode and cold cathode tubes. They're, they're fascinating.